Okay, let's talk about then uh, traveling in the winter. Well, basically, you have a few different ways. To, uh, if the snow is deep enough, you're going to have to have snowshoes and skis on. All right. And then if, if you're on ice, you're going to have to have boots with crampons. And, and then how are you going to pull all this stuff or, or move it? Are you going to put it all in a pack? Or are you going to use a, a small sled or what we call a pole or, or dog sleds? Just want to briefly talk about this. Snowshoes are just a way to keep uh, yourself on top of the snow, as you all know. There's the traditional kind, which has the rawhide lacing, and then there's some of the new kinds, which has the decking. They actually have their pluses and minuses. The, the uh, traditional laced ones, you know, they're more work and, of course, things like that. But at the same time, if you're in powder snow, when you take a step and you pull your foot out, you, you don't take any snow with you. As a, you know, it, it drifts through the sieves of the, of the lacing. Whereas if you have one that has decking on it, you could be pulling snow up with every step that you take. So you want to be thinking about what kind of snowshoe you need for the environment that you're, that you're in. Can you drill holes in it if you have some of the decking? Because it seems to me it's just plastic. Like yeah. Hard plastic, it's impossible to do that. Yeah. And it, and, it, and it may weaken it a little bit. Uh, that brings to mind a, a, a something about native-made snowshoes and drilling holes and how we would do it. But yes, you, to answer your question, you can. But, and this may be related to this too, so to think in terms of this when you do drill the holes. So if you see a, a pair of native made snowshoes, there is, uh, you know, the snowshoe goes around like this, and it has a block of wood through the middle, kind of where you put your foot. You know, can everybody visualize what that block of wood is? It kind of holds the snowshoe together, and that's what the lacing attaches to. So you've got a toe part of the lacing, and you've got a, a, a back part, okay? There's this piece of wood that goes across the snowshoe, okay? So the way the natives would do it is that you, you would see it, and there were, the holes would just be kind of like haphazard. Whereas if we made it, we would have the holes going straight across, right? <laughs> and you're going, what a slack job way of making a pair of snowshoes, you know, to have the, the holes haphazard like that. The reason they're doing that is because they don't want it to break with the grain of the wood. <laughs> okay, so they're actually thinking about it a little bit. So they've got them offset a little bit. So you may want to think, and the stuff could rip. You don't want to put all the, the holes in a line. Okay. I noticed in the film that you showed those were big shoes. Uh huh. Those yeah. Those were bigger shoes than you can usually see in any film. Yeah, with the Apple uh, my shoes. Yes, um, you know, and it just fits on the snow, like the snow that's up in uh, the, yeah, Minnesota or Michigan like we were in. Those are about the right size shoe if you were carrying a pack. I mean, it, it, it floated those people pretty well, so those were, shoes were probably about, probably about that one. Yeah. Uh, skis, um, you know, if you're going somewhere on a, on a trek with skis, you want to have skis that aren't going to break on you. And there's a, um, just the kind of cross-country ski that we usually use around here is not going to be adequate. You're going to have to get something with a steel edge on it. Uh, and, you know, some of the old standbys are the Fisher E99s, or I think was, uh, was a ski that, that, uh, that was used for years in the Arctic. But there's other brands, too, now. But you want a good sturdy ski that you can use. Don't know very much about boots and crampons. That's more of a mountaineering uh, thing, and there are other people who probably know a lot more about that than I do. Uh, with regard to packs, you want to have probably about a third of the weight that you're going to be carrying on your on your back, and the rest of it in the sled. It just makes it so much easier to be able to carry all the stuff that you're going into the into the um, you know the wilderness with. Um, if you have it all on your back, you're just going to have a huge problem with you know carrying that much weight in snowshoes and the terrain and it gets rough and stuff like that. And if you have it all in the sled, then it can get away from you too. Especially you know if you're going around a curve or something, or there's a downhill part and it starts to pull on you. You know with all this weight on the snowshoes. So it's better to try to get your your balance that you like. Yeah. Do you have a special uh, sled or is it just a regular uh, snow? I do have special ones, of course. <laughs> But I, but the, what the, the teachers were using is what I first started out with, and that's is that you just go get a kid's plastic sled, and, and you got to kind of look at the plastic too. There's different 
types of plastic. There are some that will break real easy in cold weather, and there are some that will withstand cold weather pretty well. And I think that we got we got some from Canada, so we knew they were probably going to withstand cold weather pretty well. You know, of course, you want the the, the the bow of it, so to speak, to not be so that you're snow plowing, so that it rides up over the snow like like this sled right here. In front of that hop rides up over the snow. So you know you can just use a, a, a kid sled to just make sure that it has a good design and you saw the way that they were lashing their stuff in there with just laying a duffel in there and then and lashing it in. And it works fine. It absolutely works fine. Uh, things that we've used uh, We've used just the ropes. In fact, when we went across back an island, we just had ropes going back to our sled from our pack. So you use the harness of your pack as your harness as well uh, for your sled and just leave the ropes back. And or, or you can make, uh, if you want harder ones that you think got, got more control back there, we use PVC pipe also to, to control the sled, to, to go back. Well, you get going downhill. Downhill, then you have to watch with if you just have ropes and you have to do it right. right. You have to do it with another person. So they'll have a rope on your back. Okay. And then you'll be going, you know, downhill. It depends on the, the grain, but of course you can't have the stud get away from you and pulling you down. Right. So you have to you have to be really careful. So the, the partner hangs on the back and Yeah, the and the blowers it, yeah. Yeah. And they may and then you may have to shovel sleds, you know, go back and get that person's sled and do the same thing. So you have to, you know, you saw on the film they were uh, I guess the worst place was going across that snow bridge. Where they didn't want that sled going to the side or right. going off into the water. Okay. Is that a hook with the beaner or something like that? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's a you sit on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's been tried too. Uh, with regard to you know dog sledding, using dogs versus hogs, both of them have their merits. And, and to be honest, uh, I've I've done both in, well, on a seven-day trip with just hogs. We did. The same speed that you can do with dog sleds, okay? Because dog sleds are a lot of work. I mean, the dogs—I don't know how your dogs work, but they—they they fight. They fight. Well, yeah. our, the, the ones that we were with <coughs> fought constantly. Yeah. I mean, if they stop, they're fighting. And as long as they're moving and working, they're probably okay. But uh, we, you know, we, we had to be really careful with people apart. Yes. Yeah. 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 Teams. Yes. Yes. All the teams. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a huge, huge thing because once they get on two different sleds, then they're arch enemies, you know, if one doesn't have, it's all, you know, just, it's not incredible how, how it can get, and you don't want to get in the right, right, yeah, but so you can go, you know, if you're going on a really long expedition, though, for example, when we were going to the Magnetic North Pole, that was three weeks that we were out for, so for the, the, the level of fitness that, that the group had, probably the dog sled was the better. Um, you carry it. Yes, you can carry yes, more. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah, you can yes, carry yes. more. Yeah, you have. Um, uh, there's. You don't need drops, food drops. You can. You can carry more and sustain yourself more uh, for a long period of time. Maybe it's safer. Certainly, yeah. There's advantages. Uh, certainly, uh, lots of advantages with uh, safety of just the dogs with regard to the polar bear too. Uh, we have never been on a trip where we didn't have one dog. Just yeah, I mean, when you're doing your walk, your skiing, you have a dog with you. Yeah, well, yes. Even when we were pulling the poles across Baffin Island, there was a dog with us. Is he just on his well, he's, he's loose. The ones that are pulling the sled are on his back. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, but, we'll, but uh, a, good, a good dog is worth a lot with the polar bears, yes. So we always had a dog. Do you take uh, the dog food with you, or do you get the same? Do they? Yeah. They, uh, they, we take the food with us. They, they, uh, for example, on, on, uh, in three weeks, we had 18 dogs, and we were gone for three weeks, 20, 21, 20 days, actually. And they ate 800 pounds of food. Seven, no, 700 pounds of food. They ate 700 pounds of food. Did you kill some for to eat, or you just carry a lot of food? Just carry that food with us in the sleds. The sleds each weigh about six or 700 pounds. So basically one sled was devoted to, to their food. And we had two big sleds and two small sleds. Yeah, so uh, they don't, but you don't have to, you know, the nice thing about the dog is, is you don't have to, to uh, melt water for it. 
and that's probably one of the biggest things for human. Our consumption of water is, is immense. You know, we, 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 in that three week period, we melted over a ton of water. You know, a, a do, you have, do you have a member of the expedition that's adjusted on these or several that are adjusted on the Yes, a couple of them. Yeah. For higher, they were just no, no, they, they were just, that was their job. Yeah, just to take care of the dogs, feed the dogs, you know, right. stake, the, stake the dogs out at night. Yeah. Very true. I've seen Jeff is at 25,000. Is that even right. cheaper? Oh, yeah, sure. Better. Yeah, well, I don't know. There's cheaper ones, but if you're going to go to the geographical North Pole, you can count on being in the $20,000 range. Um, but our trip was, I think, around $7,000 to go to the magnetic North Pole. And it was a good long trip. What is what the problem where the cost comes in is is in flying you to the remote site. I mean those pilots that are doing that are they're the best that there are and, and, and they but they probably have a lot of, a lot of insurance that they have to pay. So that's where the bulk of the cost comes. It's just getting you up there. Hmm. Okay, so